Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson three of the Subshoot series of 8086 assembly programming tutorials, and we're looking at the second part of the Wonderswan code today. Last time we looked at the sprite drawing code, this time we're going to go over the rest of the code. That's the main game loop and the bits of logic that are tied into it. Now, the game, of course, works on the Wonderswan classic, which you can see up here. We have to shoot the bats with our cursor, and the game makes a silly noise. And if the bats get to the front of the screen, they get bigger as they get closer, and if they get to the very front of the screen, then the player will be hurt, when the player runs out of lives, then the game is over. Say the game works on the classic Wonderswan and the Wonderswan Color. The game was ported from the MS-DOS version, and also that was ported from 6809, and uh, the Vectrex and the um, Dragon. So it, it's a little multi-platform game that's intended as a test. And it's based, to some extent, on the Simple Series joystick reading example, just with a few little bits of improvement and big, bigger graphics and things. Now, the idea of all of this, of course, is that you can download it, you can use the source code in your own games, as I always say in all of my tutorials. Oils. You're welcome to download the source code and make amazing and far better things than I possibly can with it. And if you somehow manage to sell those, then you're welcome to do so because as I say, they're, they're just little bits of fun that hopefully you can get some benefit from. Anyway, let's go over to the source code. Let's take a look at the parts we're looking at today. Okay, so here is the code. So we're looking at um, this file here, Wonderswan suck shoot here. Now, at the start of the game code here, we're defining the memory that we're using for our RAM variables. We're defining this area here, which is part of the RAM of the system. And then we've got a variety of variables here relating to our player. Um, we've got the, the, the cursor X and cursor Y used by the font. X, player X and Y are the um, crosshair. Enemy X and Y are the enemy position. Scale and sprite, we discussed those last time. Those are how the um, sprite is selected for the enemy bat. Uh, we got a random seed for our random number generation and high score and score in binary coded decimal. Now we've covered binary coded decimal in the um, multi-platform series. So please go and take a look at that if you need to know more about binary coded decimal. We're not going to cover that today. Um, but it's a, basically we've got all of our variables for our game here. We've also got something called BCD score add. Now the BCD routine will add a BCD value to a BCD value. However, they both need to be in the same segment. And so being as our destination, our score is in RAM, um, we're going to have to use that template value in RAM as well, and so we'll see that filled in. Now, at the start of the code here, you can see we've got lots of stuff relating to the setup of the screen and the transferring of the data for the graphics and things like that. If you need to know how all of that works, please see the simple series or the platform-specific series where we discussed that kind of thing before. I'm not going to go over it again because I'm quite tired of it in a lot of ways, you know, explaining the same things over and over again. So take a look at those if you need the details on that. But basically, this is a a good template, if you will, for the starting point of this uh, this program. Okay, so the actual start of today's code is this here. So what we're doing here is we are zeroing the high score. So we're selecting the segment of the high score here, which is the data segment here. We're selecting the memory address of the high score. We're zeroing the word in AX here, and we're storing that word twice to the high score. The high score is four bytes, that's eight digits. So that's just zeroing that out, that out there. Then we're showing our title. We're clearing the screen here. We're showing our suck shoot string here, which is the text you can see just here that's being shown there. And then we're showing the high score string. Now that's the top line, that's the text you can see there. And then what we're doing here is we are loading, we're locating the cursor, and then we're loading the address of the high score, and we're running the BCD show routine, which will show the bytes. And that was covered in the multi platform series. So please take a look at that if you need to know how that works. Now, we're going to use the show enemy routine to show this great big gob gobby bat here. We're going to show that. Now, the way this works, if you missed last time's lesson, is um, we have two variables that affect the bat frame of animation being used. Now, one is the so-called sprite, and this is only either one or zero. This is the frame of animation. The rest is defined by the scale, which goes from zero up to about 64, I think it is, and defines which of the sizes of the sprite that we're using. We're using the biggest one here. So we've just got to give correct values for the size that we want here. And then we go into our main title screen loop. And all our main title screen loop does is it zeroes the total sprites. And this is because we're going to draw a single sprite. And we need to we need to zero the sprites before each draw to make sure any no longer needed sprites are removed from the screen. And then what we're doing is we're XORing the frame of animation here with one. So that's going between one and zero there. And we're running the show enemy routine each time, which is affecting our animation there. That's how the animation is done. We've then got a crude delay here, just to slow the game down a bit. We read in the joystick with a generic joystick reading routine, and we test the bit relating to the fire button. And if the fire button isn't pressed, we wait on that title screen for a bit longer. Now, when we're on our title screen, and we press the fire button, 
just show you, I'll do it on the black and white one. Yeah, when we press our fire button here, the game will start. So that's um, that's what we're doing there. We're just waiting for the fire button to be pressed. Now, when the game starts, we're running this routine, which you'll see quite often called wait for release. Now this is checking the fire button and waiting for the fire button to be lifted up. And this is because we don't want the um, the game over screen to be skipped because the player is frantically holding down fire or something. We want to wait for the fire button to be released so that the player can see what's going on. Then we're clearing the screen. We're randomizing the first position of the enemy. We're zeroing the score here. We're then initializing the BCD score add here, and we are storing a value of five in there. Now, actually thinking about it, this, this could have just been done at the very start of the game because it, it never changes. So this could have been done with a high score, but it, it doesn't matter. And then when initializing the variables for the game, so the lives, the player starts with four lives, the center of the screen for the X and Y position here, the speed of the enemy, the enemy gets faster after each bat's been killed. And then we're showing the starting values of the score there. Update score actually updates the visual representation of the score. That's what that does. So that's what um, that's what all of that does. And then we've got our main loop here. Now, um, these tutorials use a simple sound driver called Chibi Sound, which I've covered in the platform specific series. This takes a single byte and the byte makes a sound effect. It's for very crude sounds in my games. I need a very simple um, base platform for all of my games to be written on so that I can port to lots of games, lots of different platforms very quickly. So Chibi Sound is very unremarkable, but it's good enough for this. Now, the way it works is there's a timeout. When the timeout reaches zero, the sound is silenced by writing a zero byte to Chibi Sound. So that's just a simple delay loop that allows the sounds to be played for a short period and then, then muted. Now, at the start of this routine, again, we're zeroing the total sprites. Now, this total sprites will be increased when we actually draw our objects to the screen, and we'll see that later on. We're then doing our read joystick again. Now, each of the directions is in one of the bits of the return here. Now, what we're doing here first is we're loading AH with a four here. We're also loading the AH and DL with the X and Y position. I should have said that. We're loading those, but we're loading AH with four, and then we're testing fire two here. If you press fire two, you will be able to move faster. Let's just check that out, check it actually works. So here's my slow movement. And then there's my fast movement, slow movement, fast movement. So that does work. So that's what we've got there. I think as the game gets harder, you do maybe need to move a little bit faster later on. So we've got that as an extra bonus option there. So AH is the movement speed there. And then what we're doing, and this is identical, I think, to the simple series. We're testing each of the directions, up, down, left, and right here. And then what we're doing here is we are checking to see if we're already at the extremity of that boundary. And if we're not, then we're subtracting or adding the movement size here. So that's basically allowing this movement to move each of the directions by the correct speed here. So that's that's what that's doing there. So we've just checked all of the directions and updated the player as required here. And now what we're doing here is we're storing the new player position back into the variables there. Now we're going to show the objects to the screen. So we're showing the target, which is the player, and then we're showing the enemy, which is the bat, of course. And then we've got a delay loop just to slow the game down again. And then we get the, uh, we stored the directions in AX here, and then we're just getting them back again here. And we're now checking the fire button. If the fire button is pressed, we're going to make the firing sound, and then we are going to set the sound timeout here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check if the player is in within, in range of the enemy. In other words, if the player has shot the enemy. And we covered that in the multi-platform series as well. It's just a simple range checking routine. And it will set the carry if the player with it is in range of the enemy. So we, we're doing that. And then if the player is, no, is not in range of the enemy, the carry is clear, then we're going to skip over the next section because this is going to kill the enemy. So we change the sound we're playing for the hit sound. We increase the enemy speed, so the, the enemy is going to get faster next time, give us more of a challenge. And we add the score, the five points to the current player's score here, and we update the score. And we give the enemy a new position, and also that makes the enemy smaller again. Now, if the player hasn't pressed fire, or if the player has pressed fire and didn't, didn't hit, then we're going to carry on, and we're going to now process the movements of the enemy. So we're updating the enemy speed counter. We're basically um, adding the current enemy speed to the enemy speed total here. And if that's overflowed, then we're going to increase the scale of the enemy here. And each time, we're also flipping the frame of animation for the enemy, and that makes the bat flap, like you can see just there. That's nice. Nice, simple, flappy animation there. So that's what we're doing there. Now, if the enemy has got to the maximum size, which is 64, then the enemy has bitten the player. And so what we're doing here is we're re-randomizing the enemy position. We're making the bitten sound. We're setting the timeout again. And we're decreasing the life counter because the player has been hurt once. Um, we're going to update the score if there's lives left. But if there aren't, then we're going to go to the game over routine. And we'll have a look at that now. 
So the game over routine again, waits for the fire button to be lifted up, silences the sound, clears the screen, shows the game over message, and then it compares the current score to the high score. And if the high score is lower, then we are going to update the high score. So what we're doing here is we're transferring all four or eight digits of the high score of the score to the high score here that updates the high score and then depending on whether we've got a high score or not we're going to show a different message here so we've got a high score message which is new high score and we've got a no high score message which says you suck because we are disappointed in the player's performance and we need to encourage them to do better by insulting them. That's shorter work. So that's what we're doing there. And then basically, whichever happened, we end up here and we are reading in from the joystick, waiting for fire to be pressed and jumping back to show title. So that's, um, that's all there is to that. Now, um, the print child routines are just using the tile map to show characters to the screen. That's the same as the Hello World example. The clear screen routine is doing two things. Um, firstly, it's clearing the tile map. It's just writing zero tiles for all of the tile map here. And it's also setting the sprite count to zero, which effectively removes all of the sprites to the screen. Now, the final thing we've got is the read joystick routine, which is the, uh, it's the same as a simple series, I think. I don't think it's changed, but anyway, we'll just quickly cover it. So basically what we're doing is we're, we've got to read in from the two parts of the system, the up, down, left, and right, and the fire buttons and the start. And what we're doing is we're moving them into up, down, left, right, fire one, fire two, and then the start button in this case. So uh, we are going to have to shift the bits from each of the directions into the correct position in our so-called build-up byte. So we're building each byte up, each bit up into a H from AL. So we're reading AL from the port and we're moving the bit that we actually want in order into a H here. And then we're doing the same with the um, fire buttons here. So it's, it's, very, uh, it's a bit of a pain this to get this into the right format I wanted. But uh, as I say, it works well enough. And um, by getting the fire buttons in the same direction for every system, it means I can port to more systems more quickly, which is what I want to do. So there we go. So that's the end of today's lesson. As I say, you can download the source code for today's example and have some fun with it and play the game if you really want to. It's not an amazing game, but it's what it is. Um, if you've liked what you've seen, please like and subscribe. We're going to be um, porting Suckshoot to more things in the future, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to the Wonder Swan at some point in the future once the other systems have had their fair shares. And as I say, if you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to more people. It helps me out a lot. And if you subscribe, then you'll see all of the other amazing or vaguely interesting, at least, content that I've got planned in the future. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.